You're listening to Life Strategies with Monique. Get ready to be empowered and inspired. Hey there, and thanks for tuning in to this week's episode of Life Strategies with Monique. In this week's episode, I am interviewing Marilyn Wilson. Marilyn is a freelance writer and editor with a passion for interviewing women all over the world. In 2007, Marilyn co-launched a very successful, innovative magazine that was focused on professionals working in the fashion industry, paired with photography and illustration by local artists. She has written several articles, all of which have been published in Rain Magazine, Shown Magazine, and Metro Living. Wilson has taken her passion to a new audience with the release of her first book that is titled Life Outside the Box, The Extraordinary Journeys of Ten Unique Individuals. This is the first of a new series called Real People, Real Lives. And in today's episode, Marilyn is going to share with you her story, her journey on how she ended up becoming a writer at the age of 50. I am so sure at the end of this episode, you are going to be so empowered and inspired. Stay tuned. Well, hello, hello, everyone, and welcome to another Life Strategies with Monique. Today, I have with me author Marilyn Wilson. She is a freelance writer, speaker who actually began her career at the age of 50, and she's here today to share with us her journey to acceptance. Hi, Marilyn. Hi, how are you doing, Monique? It's so great to be here today. I'm sorry you don't have the sunny weather we have. <laughs> no, it is horrible here. <laughs> you know, it's that hurricane season. You know, this time of year, we get lots and lots of rain. It'll rain for a while, and then it will absolutely turn sunny. So it's... it's, it's a, and everything will be beautifully green. Yeah, I mean, so it's, it's back and forth, you know. So today is one of those days, so... Yeah. So Marilyn, so, go ahead and um, go ahead and share with us your story because I am just so amazed because you always say that life begins at fifty, and I think to myself, "Wow, life begins at fifty. Or well, you actually started your your career of writing at the age of fifty. So <laughs> share, share with my listeners how you got there. I mean, because I mean that is just so like <laughs> amazing. <laughs> The, the universe guides us in the most amazing ways. Um, growing up, I did not fit into the role that my parents needed me to fit into. Just, I was very ADD and not your typical girl. And again, I'm 60, so this is back in the 50s in, in the Midwest of the U.S. And, and there was a lot of pressure to fit in and to be a certain type of person. And and I just, I just didn't fit in. And growing up, um, the other side of the coin was that I was very uh, tuned into people. I was very aware of their disapproval. Um, I was also tuned in to people suffering around me and felt great compassion and draw, was very drawn to them. So you've got somebody who doesn't fit in, who, who came to feel she was very broken, who was interested in people. So I jumped into uh, in university psychology and I was actually in my master's working on my master's in counseling and drug abuse. Um, sure that I was going to be the counselor that would step out, the world would welcome me and I would make everybody better. <laughs> you wow. know, it was just, I know <laughs> we're, we're so, we're so, um, I was so sure because of my empathy for people and because I, I struggled with so many things that I would be the person to bring health to them. And, mm -hmm. and my professor was talking one day, um, I was lucky to be in a school where the master's professors all worked in the industry. So they brought real life experiences and he started talking about his, his year and he'd had a couple suicides. Um, He'd had a father who was feeling sexual feelings towards his daughter, but hadn't acted on them. He couldn't do anything. And then I found out that in general at that time, uh, success for counselors in marriage and family, which is where I was headed, was only 5%. Mm. That, that people who came only came as a last ditch effort to prove they tried. And suddenly this bubble burst. I thought I was going to change the world. <laughs> and, uh, Instead, I was going to sit and, and fail 95% of the time. Mm. And, and 
there was very little I would get to do besides sit behind a desk unless I got my PhD. I left home at 17. I did not have money to, to start over nor to pursue higher education than I had. And so I, I walked away. And so the whole plan for my life fell apart. I, I had nothing. And I just kind of, for the next, oh, 20, 30, you know, couple decades, I, I was lost. Um, I ended up moving from Southern California to Seattle. I met my husband who's Canadian there. So in 1984, I moved up to Canada and we had, we were given very poor chances of having children. And instead we, we were rabbits. I had three kids in three and a half years. <laughs> um, and the daycare costs for three kids three and a half and under were far too expensive. So oh, yeah. I gave up the idea of going back to work. I mean, I've been working since I was 17. It never dawned on me. I wouldn't go back to work. And I thought when they start school, I'll go back to work. And, and at that point, um, it became clear my oldest son had something going on. There was some sort of learning disability um, as well. He was not a manly man and he was in a group of kids at school that were really macho sports addicts so bullying got really bad and if your oldest one is bullied the other ones get bullied so all, all three of my kids were not safe walking to school and home mm. and that really hurt our family demand dynamics and again it it tapped into that part of me inside that felt I wasn't good enough you know I produce these children they're getting bullied I can't stop it so I spent honestly, most of my life really feeling very broken and, and not making very many friends because I felt that if they really got to know the me inside, like when I was small, they wouldn't like me. Mm. Um, when my kids hit teenage years, they kind of got their feet under them and the ADD focus needed to move off them. And so I sat down at the computer and got on a site called Craigslist, which is just things for sale, odd jobs, all kinds of stuff and thought, well, what's out there in terms of jobs and saw an ad for a New York fashion magazine that was looking for submissions. Now I grew up poor. <laughs> my mother grew up poor. Um, my husband and I did not have money at that point. Um, I was cutting his hair. He was cutting mine. Um, my clothes came from thrift stores or the Canadian equivalent of, of Kmart. Um, but I thought, how hard can this be? I, I got A's in English, you know, I can write. I know a couple designers in the area through my daughter who did a little modeling and this will be fun. I still remember thinking this will be fun. And I sent off three ideas and two were accepted. And that's the moment that everything really shifted for me. What I did was leap on a lark at something I thought would be, be fun to try. And instead it, it catapulted me into a decade long journey. Um, the first interview was with a First Nations Métis woman who was a fashion designer, and she talked for two hours straight. I ended up with 12 typewritten pages of, of transcribed notes, mm. and she shared not only her journey, but she shared things about their generational ideas, such as honoring your elder and honor among people and regalia, and I had literally goosebumps from head to toe the whole time. I'm sitting there with my mouth hanging open. <laughs> Fortunately, she was very kind to me because I didn't know what she was doing. So she just kept talking. Mm -hmm. um, and I walked out and the air sparkled. I, it was like returning to my passion of young. Here I was um, listening to somebody's story and being the privilege of hearing somebody's story and learning about a different way of looking and thinking and and somebody else's life. And instead of being considered, excuse me, instead of being considered nosy, I, they were happy. And all I had to do was write an article to get this gem and to keep doing this. I just had to write an article. I could do that. Well, I learned that, that writing term papers in high school is not the same as, as writing magazine articles at 50. And it took me a while to get it right. Um, I got all my interviews done. I got both my articles there. All the stuff was there. And the magazines folded before my articles even went to print. I was offered money. I was supposed to be paid. And the, from that, the team photography team was supposed to be paid. I had to go to everybody and tell them it's off. It's done. There's no money coming. And I was so wow. done. And I thought, I can do this. I can do this. So I spent almost probably nine months emailing everybody 
I am here. I'm ready to interview. I just want to write. I just need an open door. And all I got back was crickets because I'm 50 years old. I've been out of the job market for 15 years and I had no experience or credentials in writing or journalism. Nobody wanted me. The world was not waiting for me. Um, there were no open arms and it was really depressing. So I went back on Craigslist and it just again, trying everything I could to open a door and made a post that I knew a couple fashion designers. I just wanted the opportunity to write. I lived in Vancouver. Would anybody like my services? And I met a photographer who wanted to start a local online magazine that, uh, it was a fashion magazine, but instead of focused on fashion, it was to promote the people working in our industry, which was very different. And again, it tagged into my wanting to hear people's stories and promote people and share with the world. So within six months, he, he sort of thought he could just have some writers and they'd do everything. He didn't realize you needed some organizational things. So within six months, he and I made a, an agreement that I was the editor and part owner of this magazine. So with no, no experience, suddenly I was an editor, a scheduler, an ad sales person. I found writers, I trained writers, I, I looked really, I did everything but the photography. And I had to attend tons of events. And it took me about six months to realize I was the only one who didn't have the right clothes. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I didn't yeah. know how to put on makeup. I didn't oh, wow. go for many petties. I didn't have the latest hairstyle. I didn't even know the names in the fashion world who were the biggest ones. And so, you know, again, there's that the joy of being out and doing what I want to do and, and learning and growing and taking on this new career was offset with the realization that I had no idea what I was doing. And I was learning in the public eye and making mistakes in the public eye. And other people in the industry didn't throw their arms open and said, oh, Marilyn, we're so glad you're here. I had to earn my credentials. There was a lot of talking behind the scenes, and, and I cried a lot. I, I cried a lot. But what I decided to do was every time I saw people, I, I'm an older woman, so I could open my arms and say, hi, how are you, and give them a hug and tell them how great they're looking. And slowly over time, the politics eased a bit and I started to get some some skills behind me and some recognition and I started to work with a stylist and save my pennies and every season's in fashion or twice a year so every season I bought a couple more pieces that would go with the pieces I bought last season until I had a little group of clothes that could mix and match I only wore to events I'd come home and carefully take them off and hand wash them and I slowly learned but it was hard work and I wouldn't trade it. There were incredible highs. There were terrible lows, such as when the magazine folded, I put all my branding into this. I had saved nothing on my own. And when my partner and I had to part ways, I suddenly realized I was back to square one. I was nobody again. Mm. What was I going to do? And I went in a very dark place for about six months and I decided finally I would somebody had me set up a blog and maybe write on it every day for six weeks. And at the end of six weeks, I said, no, the interest is still there. What does that mean for me? And at that point, I happened to hear my publisher, Julie Salisbury, speak at a women's meeting. And from the time she started talking, I got goosebumps again. I thought, okay, this is where I'm headed next. This will be easy, right? I've been writing for eight years now. It's going to be fine. Well, I quickly found out that uh, writing books and writing longer pieces is is much more difficult and that six months job of writing a book was 18 months of anguish and deciding to quit and deciding not to quit and crying and tears until with the support of my incredible community I uh, launched my first book in February 2015 and it still despite that took me three years to write my second book which I just launched in June so I am that real mix of highs and lows and I can honestly say at this point um, interviewing is the best therapy I ever ever had I, I listen to people all the time okay with their journey and embracing their journey without apology and handing me little bits of wisdom of how they dealt with different problems. And over the course of this last 10 years, they have 
have helped me grow. They've helped me learn how to embrace the right friends to acquire a tribe around me. I could not do what I do without. And I am humbled and grateful. And that's what your second book is about, right? Right. The, um, yeah. The, the wisdom of li- listening is listening yeah. all of the stories that you've gained over the years. Right. The first book, because of where I was at the time, was called Life Outside the Box, The Extraordinary Journeys of Ten Unique Individuals. And the point of that book for me was to go back through the interviews and pick some people who really inspired me and changed my life and and tell their biography. And these 10 bios are completely different. They all, some are silver spoons, some came from horrendous backgrounds, some are, are wealthy, some were poor, but they all lived their life without apology. So I was working on book two and my passion project was the wisdom of listening and I was going to allow myself the privilege of writing it when I'd accomplished enough work. And one day I realized that what I needed to do was write that book because it was time to give wings to all the wisdom people then sharing with me. The idea for the book came in an interview with artist Pamela Masick. She had a really difficult upbringing and struggled with self-doubt and her art was her therapy and she said I remember standing with my my hand to the canvas shaking afraid I'd made make a mistake and she said I began to realize over time that art was a piece of gold I held in my pocket that I could use to help other people improve their lives as well and she started an art charity for our our depressed area which is called the downtown east side for women living on the streets and in very poverty to help them uh, deal with their problems through art the way she did. So that's always been in the back of my mind is pieces of gold. Another time somebody said, was on stage speaking and said, what do you, do you see what I see? And I stopped for a minute. I got those, I get goosebumps at important moments. Mm-hmm. And I thought, why does this sound right to me? And I realized that I now had the image of people walking around with gold in their pockets. So when I looked around the room, I saw a chance to go diving for gold. Hmm. And so that's what this book is. It's, it's my chance to give wings to all the wisdom that's get, been given to me to pass it on, to pay it forward. And my hope is that people find bits of wisdom in there that relate to what they need at that time. I continually tell people, everybody around you has wisdom waiting for you. Mm-hmm. And you never know who it's going to be. The other day in the midst of my self-doubt, I was talking to my older brother and I who have often been on very different pages and he had my piece of wisdom that day. I hung up the phone crying. Another day, it's my very scientific husband who, who no religion, no new age, no nothing. He turned around and said something to me and I was floored. Another time it's when somebody I talked to on the subway when I was in New York City. So these bits of wisdom don't just come from speakers and writers and people who have survived great tragedy. Every day we get up and face life. Every day is an act of courage and everybody around you is holding this wisdom. And all you have to do is open a conversation to find out what they have for you. Mm -hmm. And so I I encourage everybody, you know, talk to people around you. Who catches your eye when you walk in a room? Make an effort. If they're not interested, that's okay. But but wisdom is all around us waiting to be given to us every single day. We are not alone. And we don't have to walk this life alone. Mm. That is absolutely powerful. Um, The wisdom of listening because, and I've always been told as a kid, you have one mouth and two ears (laughs) that you should always do more listening than you do talking because that gives you an opportunity to gain insight on, you know, who's ever having this conversation with you. So, and that just gives it more um, concreteness when you talk about it's important that we listen. Because people are sharing things with us that whether we realize it or not, they're sharing with us nuggets of gold. And that's, that's powerful because you never, yeah, go ahead. Well, there is a story. I'm not particularly religious, but I always really like this story. And it's somebody's, I don't remember they're in a boat or there's something's happening and, and people keep coming by and offering help. He says, no, you know, God's going to help me. And in the end he, he drowns or I can't remember the exact story, but he says, why didn't you help me? He says, I sent three people to help you. And 
I, I really hold to that. I really hold to the idea that there are people in our life there to help us. And if we don't open a conversation and we never listen, if we're not open to receiving this wisdom, then the help that's been sent to us, we've refused it. Mm -hmm. So uh, the hard part for me is always uh, knowing when to talk and when to listen. Mm -hmm. Because there are times people need something from you as well. And so a conversation is a great way to start because yes. there are no expectations. I always say I walk in a room now and just kind of stand there for a minute out of the way and look around and see who I'm attracted to. Is there anybody who catches my eye or, or I'll, I'll strike up a conversation with the, the uh, security guard at the door or the person standing next to me. I, I never know who's going to be that interesting conversation. And it's, it's, it's a joyful process and it makes going out a lot more fun. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it does, doesn't it? <laughs> well, so when we started this conversation, we we I, we talked a little bit about um, you began this journey at fifty, and you're not yeah. fifty anymore, right? Because time has progressed. <laughs> you're sixty-three, and I'm pointing that out because I want our listeners to understand that it is oh. a journey, and it's never too late to begin something new. I keep telling people, I used to about every four years change jobs and I, I just get bored. It's the ADD, I guess. But I tell people that we get logged into my career is going to be and it's set for our life. And that's not true. I Will I always be a writer? I, I don't know anymore. I'm open to the possibilities. So when I started writing, it was at 50. When I launched my first book, it was four days after turning 60. And I thought, I've missed the mark. Because there is ageism out there. Don't kid yourself. There is ageism out there. Mm -hmm. And I, I thought, I'll never make a go of this. Uh, it, it's, it's what do I think I'm doing? And I stumbled across the story of Harry Bernstein, who is my absolute hero. He was uh, married, worked as a writer, um, in some function, not an author, but worked in the industry doing some sort of writing and tried many times to write books, none of which made it to, to publication. And he gave up. When his wife died, he was 93 and he was incredibly lonely. They've been married 60 years. And so he thought, I'm going to try writing again. And he sat down and wrote his memoir of his growing up in England and immigrating to the U.S. And uh, it's, I've read it, actually. It's wonderful. Sent it off to a publishing house, which is how things used to get published back then. Mm -hmm. And it sat on somebody's desk for 18 months. And they picked it up and said, wow, this is amazing. It, it published when he was 96, made huge waves. He wrote three more books before he passed away at 93. He was given a writer's... Um, you know, where they bring in a writer uh, for six months to work in house. He was given that and won all kinds of accolades and declared his nineties, the most productive years of his life. Wow. So that, like I said, the universe provides when you need it. So at my lowest moment of thinking I'd missed the mark, I stumbled across his story and he did it in his nineties. I had no excuse. Mm -hmm. And so I let go of that excuse. And sometimes who we are, where we are, our journey won't be the traditional path. Um, so I've always just watched, walked a non-traditional path with my writing. I just choose to do exactly what I feel I am led to do. I try to be very open to unique and new ways of marketing because I looks like I'm not going to go on any national TV soon. Um, and, that's, and that's okay. There is a place for me. And my writing needs to be out there. I feel very passionate that this is why I'm here and this is what I meant to do at this time. And I've let go of that I can't, so they won't let me. And instead going, okay, what door will open? If that door is closed, what, instead of looking at the closed door, I'm looking for the open door. I guess is a good way to put it. Right. And I keep a really... There's, there's one principle I go by very strongly now. It's called Ujamaa. Uh, it is technically a day at Kwanzaa, which is an African celebration, and it's about cooperative economics, about a village coming together as a whole to raise the status of the village up and the economics up as one unit, you know, bringing everybody up and being responsible for everyone. When I first heard this, 
what it meant to me was more uh, about bringing those principles into my daily life. Who do I want as friends? Mm -hmm. Who do I want to do business with? Who do I want to connect myself with? And it came down to people with the same principles I, I have. It came down to people that I could be mutually supportive with. I could support them and they could support me and our knowing each other improved both of our lives. And that's a little easier on the personal side, but in the business side, it can be a little more challenging finding the right relationships. But as soon as I focused on relationships were, that were positive and mutually beneficial, though all my all areas of my life improved and I hold to that today I'm very careful with who's close to me I never cut anybody out of my life but I move them farther out like tree rings mm -hmm. people that are close to me that that and the businesses I deal with um, we're on the same page we help each other I'm a benefit to them they're a benefit to me we take turns being in the spotlight mm -hmm. and that's the way I personally choose to, to work and it's really changed um, my attitude and it's changed my moods and the, there's so much more positive energy around me all the time and when you have that oh my goodness is it easier to walk through those low moments of self-doubt that we all have <laughs> <laughs> I had the best two weeks of my life around the launch I had so much positive feedback and that was followed to, by two weeks of horrifying self-doubt <laughs> you know, for, for no reason. It, right. If I looked at the facts around me, it wasn't reality. It was just something I had to walk through. We all have those swings up and down. And so who you keep around you and the, the attitude of the people, the businesses you deal with, the way you move through your life, the attitude you keep around you makes a huge difference. Yes, it definitely does. I would agree with you 100%. It's kind of yeah. like you are who you hang around. It kind of like yes. can rub off on you. If it's negative energy, that's exactly what you're going to have. Or if it's positive energy, you'll get that too, just based on who you decide to, you know, envelop yourself or hang around or put in your environment. So I think it's very important that we have uh, positive energy, positive people who can, uh, keep our energy up in our lives and also who are wanting the same goals or the same who have the same principles so yes I agree that is that is so key especially when it comes to us um, wanting success in our lives yeah another chapter that really is at the start of my next book I think I think I have chapter one is a, a very condensed bio of me because nobody likes telling their own story chapter two is wabasabi and chapter three is ujama so wabasabi was the one that came to me first and it's a Japanese concept I was introdu in, introduced to a photographer and when I was interviewing him I said what where do you get inspiration? And one, he came up with wabasabi, and it is the idea of beauty and imperfection. So if you have a cracked bowl, you fill the crack with gold. Mm. And, and if, it, you know, it talks about the beauty and aging. It talks about the beauty in your wrinkles. It talks about embracing beauty um, around us as part of life. You know, the imperfections are beauty. And that one hit me hard because, of course, I thought I was broken and crazy and nobody would like me and I didn't fit in and I, I feel stupid at bridal showers. And, you know, I just wasn't a girly girl. And so it was a novel concept that all these little pieces of me that people kept wanting to change might be part of my beauty. And what I discovered more than that was as I accepted these parts of myself, I found out they were actually my unique talents. The things that set me apart from people made me good at interviewing. The things that set me apart and the, the strength of my passion made me good at things. And so the, the opposite side of that is when I was looking at myself as broken, I attracted people into my life that, that supported that. Yeah, you're broken. You need to change. As soon as I flipped and said, no, I'm not perfect, but I'm the way I'm meant to be. And, and there is something good that can come out of all sides of me. I attracted friends that felt the same way. Mm. So, so it, it's such an intricate little dance that we want to feel good about ourselves. But sometimes we're not willing to embrace ourselves as we are. Uh -huh. um, we, we, we walk through life with this negative view of ourselves. And then we're surprised when everybody around us mirrors that back at us. So 
the two kind of go together for me now. My, my feeling and the way I look at myself. Uh, there's a spoken word poet, uh, Shane Koizan, and one of his most powerful lines is, if, if you don't see anything good about yourself, get a better mirror. Mm. <laughs> yeah. I, if there's more to that. I wish I'd written it down so I could read the whole quote right now. But um, it's a powerful little quote. Get a better mirror. Look a little closer. Look a little longer. Because it's <laughs> about you. And, and there is. You are who you are for a reason. There are no mistakes. That doesn't mean you, you don't try to be the best person you can. It's just meant that every part of you is there to help you do the job you're here to do. Mm -hmm. And so if you've got parts that don't fit in, then it's time to start looking around you and looking for those open doors and finding where they become a positive, where they lift you up instead of take you down. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh -huh. being intense, being intense and interesting other pe people can la label you nosy or an interview viewing label you a good interviewer. Mm -hmm. There's two sides to the same trait. So, um, I lived my early life with, with the comment, oh, Marilyn, if you could just, and, and the implication was if I could change, people would love me and everything would be right with the world. And in my 50s, that switched around to, oh, Marilyn, if you could just accept yourself, you'd find your purpose. And that's what I did. I found my purpose, but it took a lot of, a lot of opening doors and, and finding ways to get there. I did not have the traditional path. And if in another five years I feel led to embrace a new career, I do it without apology. I don't feel that I have to be a writer till I'm 90 to be a writer. It's, this is one phase in my life, and if it lasts 20 years, that's great. And if it's just another five, that's okay, too. Um, I'm just open to possibilities. I'm, I'm always looking for the next door that opens. Wow. I think that's something our listeners definitely needed to hear about embracing your imperfections because yes, a lot of people are so busy comparing themselves and wanting to perfect themselves when they just need to embrace who they are as individuals. And once you do that, you can have self-acceptance, which is what you say you, it led to once yeah. you embraced your imperfection. You now, you basically have accepted, you know, who you are, you know, and that's how we were created. We were created. We're not perfect individuals and we weren't created to be perfect so we do have to embrace definitely who we are as individuals i love that and and your perfections can become your strengths we we i i can't say that enough the things i disliked most about myself when i was young became my best assets when i found my career so don't shortchange yourself there's, there's many ways to look at who we are and, and the way we're using a part of ourself now might be an imperfection. If we find another avenue for it, it can become our strength. I mean, my youngest child is stubborn. And when he was a little kid, I mean, we had a tough time he, all through his teen years. But now he's out working as an adult. And that, that strength of character does him well at work. You know, it's, it's so... We have to give ourselves a break. There's two sides to everything we look at. One is the negative side of it. If we haven't found the positive side of it, it's time to start looking. Give yourself a break. Um, be good to yourself. We're, you know, people in general, I feel, are good-hearted. And I, I think the negative things that happen come because we're led to, to look down on ourselves and try to fit into boxes we don't fit in. And we get angry and unhappy and we take that out on others. So if you can do anything, there's, I don't know, did you see the movie Avatar? Yes. Yeah. There's a really <laughs> profound moment in there. This is in my second book too. There's a really profound moment in there. Um, towards the end of the movie, the alien discovers the human in his little canister where he, he gets into his avatar. Mm -hmm. And she's never seen him that way. She's only seen him as a fellow alien. Mm -hmm. And she looks in the window and she says, oh, I got goosebumps. I see you. Mm. I sat up. I've still got goosebumps when I say this. If we can walk through life and instead of seeing the veneer on the outside of people, see inside to the, to the, the potential and, and the positive things they could do. If we could truly see past the exterior to that inside, how much better would their life be? 
Wow. And, and my mentor one day said, we were talking, I was just having a really rough time one day and I reached out to her and all of a sudden, Marilyn, I see you. And I freaked out. <laughs> I said, no, you don't know. I mean, I'm sobbing on the phone. She was, and I said, I never thought if people could see inside the little person I was hiding in there that they would like me. Mm. And I said, and when I heard this in the movie, it just changed my life. I see you. It's such a power. I drove everybody nuts for six months. Whenever I put my hands on their shoulder, looked them in the eyes and said, I see you. <laughs> and it wasn't as profound for everybody else, but I still right. That. When we look around us, you think, oh, so-and-so neighbor is grumpy and blah, blah, blah. And we, we see the outside and the external and sometimes the negative. Well, those things come from a place of, not, of not accepting themselves and not loving themselves. So our job is to see inside, to, to see that lovable soul inside. Mm. And to let them know we see it. And That's give awesome. them permission to feel the same way about them. I, I even... Uh, even before I saw Avatar, somebody said to me, you know, you've lost your pop. I used to feel you walk into a room and I said, I don't fit in. I don't have the clothes. I don't have the this. And they said, that's not what we're seeing. That's not what we see when we mm-hmm. see you. Right. And even a couple of weeks ago, somebody said, you got to let go of your insecurity. You don't see yourself the way we see you. And so um, I see you as such a profound statement to me because that means they've looked past all the all the smoke and mirrors on the outside and they've looked past my personal insecurities and they're seeing the gem of me inside and they're accepting that gem the way it is and um if we could you know i try to remind myself and it's a lesson i forget you walk through life and you let people get to you and and really i come home and i think you know i need to let go of that i need to be the person who walks through life seeing the gold inside of people Mm-hmm. seeing the gem inside of people instead of seeing the the lumps and the bumps and the external things because I just feed into their own sense of insecurity when I do that. Mm-hmm. You know, when we, we talked once before and you said something that was really profound to me, it's kind of like that movie moment that you had. Yeah. <laughs> but one of the things that you said was you said, quiet the mind that wants to plan everything. And that hit me. I was like, oh, oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> She's talking to me. <laughs> my, my mind, you know, it constantly, it definitely, it wants to, it, it runs, it runs, it runs. And even when I go to bed at night, I have mm-hmm. to tell my mind to be quiet so I can go to sleep because it's constantly wanting to plan, 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 plan. Yeah. But you said that and I was like, yeah, I need to do that. Quiet the mind that wants to plan everything. It, it takes practice. I'm ADD. My mind races. Somebody says something and I've gone down 20, 20 avenues thinking about it. Um, part of why I work with the mentor, the mentor I do the last few years and her group is she is very about listening to the heart and hearing the heart speak. And the idea behind it, it's not that our, our mind is bad, but our mind is, is set up as our protector it drives us, it wants to make us successful, it wants to protect us, it wants this, it wants that, and and it can drown us out with noise. Our heart, on the other hand, it is more attuned to the opportunities around us and maybe the non-traditional paths. And so I have no problem if I think through something, in my, somebody else said to me, think through it all with your head. Like, go through all the steps, think it all out, and then get quiet. And let your heart speak because your heart will process that information in a totally different way. And I like that idea. It's not denying the mind altogether. It's just saying the mind is good at this. The heart is good at leading. So it's getting the mind to be, to do its job and then be quiet long enough for the heart to process all that Mm -hmm. and give you, give you the, the spirit's feedback on what you need to be doing, where you need to be going. There's been several times in my life somebody said, you shouldn't do an article on that. You shouldn't talk to that person. You shouldn't because, and they had a good reason. But when I stopped and thought about it, given the criteria I set up, I, I chose to go ahead and it ended up having payoff five years down the road. Amazing payoff. If I'd listened to everybody and listened to the logic of it all, I would have said, yeah, you're right. And walked away. Because I didn't, because I allowed myself the opportunity to listen to my heart as well, 
the answer I got was a little different. And so I proceeded with caution because that's the right thing to do given the feedback I was given. But I walked through that door cautiously and to see where it lead. And it ended up leading me to Australia on contract. Like I could not have dreamed of this five years ago. So the head versus the heart, they're, they're, they're meant to work together. Unfortunately, our, our mind loves to take over and it does it by keeping our thoughts busy. Yes, yes, it (laughs) does. does. I can attest to that. (laughs) Or, or you're trying to focus on one project and your mind goes, Oh, but have you thought about this? And like a a a magpie with a shiny object, your, your mind goes, it's going to go down a new direction. So yeah, it, it needs, it's, it's a part of us we need to embrace, but, but it takes with real practice you can find ways to quiet it and, and get it to step back so you can hear your heart as well. And that's, that's just practice. Mm-hmm. It's just yeah. practice. And I'm, look, I'm learning to, I'm learning to quiet my mind <laughs> and it, it does take practice mm-hmm. because if yeah. not, it just runs rampant. I mean, yeah. little rampant. So oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, look, I appreciated that nugget when we talked last. I was like, yeah, I, yeah, that's, that's me. I need to quiet that. <laughs> And I'm going to tell you, you're at the beginning of your interviewing career. Every interview you have will have those moments. And if you don't notice it, sometimes you have to go back and listen to it again. But there is, this is a new JAMA relationship. The person being interviewed gets the opportunity to share their wisdom with your listeners and to get some promotion for whatever they're doing. Mm -hmm. The listeners and you in return get the opportunity to get a piece of gold. Mm-hmm. And so I, every interview, no matter the age or what they do, I'm listening. I'm listening for that piece of gold. Is there something in here today that I'm meant to hear? Every speaker series I go to, I know there's one speaker who's, I wouldn't be there if I wasn't led to be there. There's one speaker. So I listen for that piece of gold. <laughs> yeah. I do. And I write it down and I think about it. And often I'll have an eight hour day of speakers. It's one moment in time. Wow. I'm not looking to get every, something from everybody because that one moment in time is the piece I've been waiting for. Right. Wow. Yeah. Thank you. So, so you're on a great journey. <laughs> you know, I would love to talk to you again in five years. Okay. <laughs> and hear how your life has changed and what you've learned from others. Because oh, it, wow. it took me about five, six years to see it. Right. You know, it took a lot of small little pebbles adding up before any any change came about that was was big enough to really notice. But I'm so grateful for this journey because it took me from a place of of serious self-loathing to to loving myself and and feeling I have something to offer the world. Right. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Marilyn, for sharing your story today and all the nuggets. I mean, I know our listeners have gained such great information just by listening to your story, your journey, and how you went on the road to self-acceptance and how you wrote your book. So absolutely amazing. Thank you. Um, could you tell our listeners how they could get in touch with you um, okay. if they wanted to? Absolutely. Um, fortunately, I have a website that's under my name, Marilyn R. Wilson. M A R I L Y N R Wilson.com. Uh, you can reach out through there. There's also links there to connect with me through Facebook, through Instagram. I'm not on Twitter very much right now. Um, <laughs> the website takes you to an info at if you really need to reach me. I have an email that I, I work with every day because I work on contract with people as well. And it is just business and the number one at gmail.com. So just business one at gmail.com. And that's a really, if you want to make sure I get your email within 24 hours, that's where, but I am here for you. And you know, if you're interested in some of the pieces of gold, it is in my book. Um, There's links on my website. Um, But certainly I am, I am always ready to connect with new people and to offer the kind of support that I've received. Well, thank you so much, Marilyn. Um, And to my listeners out there, please make sure that you go visit her website, check out her books. I'll also have all of her information in the show notes. So make sure you check the show notes at the end of the show. So thank you so much for tuning in to this week's session on Life Strategies with Monique.
Hey there, and thanks for tuning in to this week's episode of Life Strategies with Monique. I do hope that you were blessed this week by Marilyn's story, and I hope that you use some of the strategies that she's giving you today. So until next time, be empowered and inspired. You've been listening to Life Strategies with Monique. 